Hello, this is Dr. Flight, and this is a lecture on segmentation, segmentation strategies, and um, how we begin to segment a generic market into smaller market segments. So, so the way this works is a process called STP, or segmentation, targeting, and then positioning. And our goal here is to form a strategic plan um, that takes advantage of our corporate or organizational strengths and matches those with market segments that would be very likely to buy our product and ones that we can reach uh, that are profitable. So the first step of this process then is market segmentation, uh, which we do when we divide up um, a generic market into meaningful smaller sub-markets. We then take all of the different sub-markets and then we analyze those which we feel would be the most profitable and the ones that would have the most fit for us to target. So we will only target those segments of the generic market that we feel are most suitable for us. Then finally, we, through marketing efforts and through business positioning, we place the product um, and we create a product for the uh, specific target markets that we look to uh, satisfy in uh, the process of positioning. So the segmentation, targeting, and positioning steps are a series of strategic uh, uh, processes really that we go through um, that, that are in the middle part of the planning process for marketers to uh, engage in. So what is segmentation? Well, quite simply, it's when we take a broad, uh, heterogeneous, generic market and we break it up into um, smaller sub subsets of homogeneous consumers. So um, these subsets of consumers will all act and behave in a similar fashion relative to, to our brand. So a segment then is a group of consumers who share some similar inclination towards our brand, and that's important. A lot of times when we do segmenting, we try to find groups of people who, or consumers or, or customers, who behave um, in a certain way, or they act a certain way, or look a certain way, um, but the, the, the only difference or the only re way it really matters is if they behave a certain way relative to our brand. Um, so just because a group of consumers are all in the same age bracket, that doesn't make them necessarily a very good segment um, because just because a group of consumers are all, they meet one criteria of age, that doesn't mean they all necessarily you know, want our brand equally so or would buy our brand um, just because for any other reason. So uh, it's important then to consider um, the, the development of the segments and then the analysis of the segments to make sure that they um, fit our needs and what we want to accomplish. In fact, um, when we do the segmentation process and we come away with a, a group of different uh, consumers that are we say are heterogeneous, um, there are several aspects of the segments that we want to consider um, to say that the segmentation process was successful. So um, there are six items here. Um, we want to be able to have identifiable segments, segments that we can take action with, ones that will lead to favorable um, profitability, ones that fit our corporate uh, goals or our business goals, uh, segments that we feel will stay um, in, in place over a period of time, and then, and then verifying that our segments are different from each other um, there so that the response differences are, are really there. And so for each one of these, when we talk about identifiable, we want to make sure that we're able to, again, use segmentation criteria um, that we can, we can measure and that, that can then lead us to and help us locate 
uh, the consumers who would make up the segment. We want to be able to find consumers and make sure that we can identify them as being part of the segment that we're trying to go after. That's the identifiability concept. Um, actionability includes this idea that um, when we choose a market segment, we want a group of consumers that we can reach, um, that we can um, have contact with, that we can get our product to, um, and so forth. Um, so if we can't reach them from a marketing perspective, um, then it's very difficult to make an exchange happen and so forth. So it wouldn't really uh, lend itself to a very good market segment outcome if that were the case. Um, moving forward, a favorable cost benefit um, ratio for us or a profitable segment um, is certainly something that we want to think about as we move from this. So when we look at market segments, we sometimes look at how, so how, how large they are size-wise, um, whether the segments would be likely to do business with us, um, the, the characteristics of the segment that would make them um, worth pursuing from a profitability standpoint. Um, the fit factor oftentimes is uh, more of a cultural fit um, and a, a, a fit in a sense that our products lend themselves to the markets that we could serve and we could see themselves identifying, we could identify with our customers and we could see our customers identifying with us. Um, so that's a good fit. We may also, so there's an alignment between our strengths and then what the market needs and perhaps even a fit from a competitive standpoint too, um, when we start to think about how crowded the market segment is and how they're currently being served and so forth. Um, so um, other, other requirements then as we move forward, stability over time. Um, so again, we want to make sure that as we enter a uh, market segment, that it'll be a market segment that we'll be able to do business with for a longer period of time. And then finally, this last category, of, which says that if I segment the market into, into multiple um, sub, sub markets or subcategories of consumers, each category should be distinctly different. Um, so if I have um, two or three or four market segments, each market segment should be uniquely identifiable through the behavior, their behavior with our brand. Um, and if they're not, then we can combine them together and we could take two segments and put them together into one large segment. If the members of the two segments don't behave significantly different from each other, um, you know, relative to whether they would buy our product or like our product and, and so forth. So, um, so there's this idea of uh, distinctly different segments, market segments, and if they're not distinctly different, then we didn't do our segmentation process uh, properly. And so when we talk about the segmentation process and what we do, generally speaking, um, we do market research to identify different um, different characteristics that consumers have, and um, and then we we track to see which consumers are most likely to buy our products, um, or we look at the consumers who are currently buying our products, and we look to see what makes them special and unique, and we form a, a market segment around those who are our customers. So we look for identifying variables then. Um, so these are criteria or variables that we use to describe our markets and our market segments. Um, some folks will call these segmentation bases um, or factors that we use. Um, and oftentimes we have things such as um, demographics, geographic and behavioral type characteristics. Um, these tend to be very uh, fairly easy to measure. Um, so we can count, for instance, how many times people buy the product, um, you know, in the first first of the month, um, whether they drive through the drive through or they walk into the store to buy the product. We can measure very easily where they live and their geographic location and stuff like that. And really through surveying, we get um, a very 
Uh, it's very easy to measure things like age and income and educational levels and, and race and, and gender and things of a demographic nature. Much harder elements to measure are psychographic or psycho psychological factors, such as people's attitudes and behaviors and beliefs and um, their, their outlook on life and, and things like that, feelings, emotions. Those are all very difficult to measure because they're not directly observable. And from a research perspective, they're, they're just harder to measure in general. Um, and so, um, so that's another category of variables. Um, and psychological or psychometric variables tend to be very powerful, in fact, um, because they talk about people's lifestyles. So what we'll often do is use a combination of demographic, geographic, behavioral, and psychological um, characteristics to group our consumers. Um, we'll also use um, a needs-based analysis as well um, at various times. So um, as we move forward, we can look at the variety of different uh, characteristics, criteria, or segmentation bases that we'll use um, to, um, to identify our consumers and group them um, in, in, into similar subcategories. Um, as you are, are no doubt uh, familiar, we have demographic influences. Um, and again, those are things that are typically very easy to measure, like occupation and education, income, marital status, um, ethnicity, things of that nature. We have lifestyle in influences, which may be a little bit more difficult, and we can expand on those more in psychographic measures. And we have usage and behaviors, um, such as like when somebody buys, how often they buy, quantity in which they buy, whether they buy with other people or not, um, with their friends or, or whatnot, whether they purchase late at night or early in the morning. Um, those are all behavioral types of things. Um, and then down below, we have different um, characteristics that might lend themselves to um, uh, geography and geographic settings, um, the climate by region, um, density of population, things like that, uh, all are, are elements of uh, geographic space. Um, what we didn't talk about, though, are psychographic segmentation tools. And again, these are all elements that happen um, inside a person. Uh, it helps them, um, hel helps them make decisions, and their decision-making process is heavily influenced by emotional or uh, psychological elements, their personality, their attitude, um, their, their basic wants and needs, their belief system, their lifestyle, aspirations, self-image, and so forth. So these are the elements that really set people um, apart. Um, and again, um, they're the oftentimes the intangibles, the things you can't always see directly, of course, but yet they have a super uh, powerful effect on our decision-making processes. Um, so uh, this leads us to this idea um, that we want to be able to measure people, and um, there are typologies that exist out there um, that will place people in psychological groupings. Um, so the values and lifestyle scale V-A-L-S, the VALS scale is a scale, it's actually a product um, that can be used and purchased. You can go online and you can actually um, take this, it's a battery of questions, and it will set you into or place you into one of eight different categories based on um, your overall um, uh, outlook and, and your, your uh, primary motivations coupled with your ability to handle resources and the resources that are available to you. So uh, depending on the type, of, um, the type of outlook that you have, um, you may be placed into the innovator or thinker or striver or survivor type, type, of, a, type of a category. And that helps us understand 
um, your likelihood to buy products and what type of products you'll you would buy. So this is a this is actually a commercial product. Um, so you could subscribe to Val's. You could um, you, you can you can use it as a commercial tool to measure your consumers and then group them into uh, ones that are profitable and ones that are not and so forth. Um, so it's an idea then that self-expression and ideals and achievement help determine um, customers' product and brand's orientation. Um, so this is this is very um, doable and usable. Um, there are other aspects of personality and lifestyle that we know about that 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 encapsulate a lot of criteria that we talk about in segmentation. Um, one popular concept is the idea of an age cohort. Um, so as people walk through life as they enter through very formative years in their teens and early 20s, they very often form the core of what type of consumer they're going to be. The, pro the issue is, or the interesting element is, that the, the environment in which a person lives during those formative years is hugely impactful on their, their consumption behavior later on in life. So as people um, develop their consumption uh, beliefs, um, they become consumers, again, during the late teens and early 20s, then um, from that age on, um, they very much are shaped by the type of as, as the type of consumer they're going to be. Um, a lot of people talk about the millennials or the Gen Ys or Gen Xs or the baby boomers. Um, and, and each of these age cohorts you know, represent a huge swath of the population. Um, and they're all equally different in the sense that, they, that their time when they grew up uh, to become consumers were all markedly different from each other. Um, so, um, and you know, we're, 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 we talk a lot about millennials right now because the millennials will someday um, be middle-aged and then they'll be seasoned citizens and um, they'll, they'll reach a period when um, they have a lot of buying power, um, a lot of purchasing power, a lot of discretionary income, while right now they do not. Um, they will at some point, they'll be the shakers and movers um, financially um, who, who help uh, direct how consumption is done in another 30 years or so. Um, so um, they're, they're, you know, each successive age cohort is important uh, because it helps predict and describe the way consumption will happen years from now. Um, this really talks a little bit about taking a large group of consumers and looking at their profile in a composite sense. So when we look at age cohorts, we look at, um, you know, it's all dictated by maybe when they're born, but it's really not a description of age. It's really a description of habit and lifestyle and attitude. And at their particular point in time, um, their income levels and their educational levels and, and so forth. So when we talk about an age cohort, what we're really doing is we're got a, taking a large group of consumers and we're, we're describing them as um, a set, a set of behaviors or a set of characteristics. Um, so this is something that we might begin to start thinking about as a customer profile. When we combine psychographic, geographic, um, demographic, behavioral types of uh, criteria all together to, gr to group a group of consumers that share similar um, aspects with each other, then we can begin to um, write a profile that would describe who they are and the way they behave. Um, another product, um, kind of like Val's is a commercial product, Prism is also a commercial product, and this is done by the Nielsen Corporation. And what they do is they have upwards to 62 different um, consumer groups that are all described based on age and income and, um, and uh, buying power and the types of products they buy and so forth. So the, the Prism 
um, product gathers lots of information, regroups people into similar um, profiles, and then what we can do is we can describe a product's customer base by those profiles, or um, something that you can do is go onto the PRISM website and you can actually look up uh, geographic locations and you can see how the geographic location is populated by PRISM profile. So here's an example for the zip code 62521, which is in Decatur, Illinois. Um, this zip code is made up of people who are in the profile called Hometown Retired, Maybury-Villes, Mobility Blues, Simple Pleasures, and Traditional Times. So each one of these five different um, named categories describes a type of consumer. So the Hometown Retireds are down downscaled, mature individuals who do not have kids living with them. Um, Mayberryville are upper middle class individuals who are older without kids and so forth. So each one of these profiles can be written into a paragraph to describe the consumer based on several different segmentation criteria. Um, this is not uncommon. Lots of companies do this. Here's an example of a gas station who has regrouped or identified their consumers into five different market segments. Each market segment is uh, described here in a profile sense. So we have the Road Warriors, True Blues, Generation F3s, Homebodies, and the Price Shoppers. And for this particular gas station, their largest market segment is the Generation F3. These are upwardly mobile men and women, half under the age of 25, constantly on the go. So this skews younger um, people who are in a hurry. They drive a lot, snack heavily from their convenience store. So if I'm going to um, create a product or a service, or I'm going to focus on this particular market segment, I know that they're going to be in a hurry, so they have to have a fast uh, transaction time. Um, they're younger, um, so uh, things are going to have to be, um, you know, more up to date or or technologically um, up to date, so that it would appeal to a younger audience. Um, it needs to be, I would imagine, for all of these, but for this group, uh, a clean, a well lit environment, and so forth. Um, there are other, of course, other profiles here. There are four other profiles. Um, both the True Blues and Road Warriors each make up 16%. Uh, um, so even the smallest of their five here still represents a lot of their market. Um, so uh, so th those would not be um, ignored, of course. Um, but each of these five different customers we would want to treat uh, in a special way according to what their needs and interests are. Here's, a, here's another example for Best Buy. Best Buy has a series of different customers. There's Jill's, Berry's, Buzz's, Ray's, Mr. Storefronts, Carrie's, Helen's, and Charlie's. Um, the, the Berry's are wealthy professionals. The Mr. Storefronts are small business owners. Um, who are coming in, um, carries our young single females, and so forth. So each of these um, characters would have a profile that would focus on um, their, uh, their, their their lifestyle, their age maybe, their demographics, um, their psychological profiles, their behavioral patterns, and all of those things again, like before, come together to create a form of um, a form of a profile that can then be used to um, to to sell to sell uniquely to each one of those one of those consumers. So now what we want to do is um, think a little bit here um, as we go through the profile concept of how um, when we have a profile, um, it's, not, um, it's not 
the, the process doesn't end just simply by regrouping consumers into different groups. Um, what we need to do at that point is take each market segment and then analyze each market segment based on how they perform and how they behave. So in this particular example, this is for health insurance. Um, and there's a series of questions here that range from um, that, that where the scale here range from um, they have the service um, and they will not drop it. So they have the service and they will not drop it um, all the way down to I do not have the service and I do not want to add it. So up here is very positive down here is very negative on the scale and then we have these different questions that would be asked for each of the three market segments um, that are available so we have market segment one market segment two and then we have market segment three and we have uh, five or six questions that we would ask or pr about products and whether they own these products or have these products or not so the insurance minimizers, so that was the name that was given to this group, this cluster of consumers. They are all generally planning to drop or cut costs. Um, their goal here is to minimize their insurance expense. They do not want to be overinsured for sure. They're going to price shop. They're going to probably not be very loyal customers. Um, that's and, and this is all driven by the data that we're that we're, we're getting and it describes this group of consumers. The basic buyers are the ones who want the key products, but they do not want the extra products. So they're willing to take the products that are most important, generally speaking, so life insurance, accidental death, and uh, prescription drugs. Once we start getting into the long-term disability second opinion of surgery and separate coverage for accidents those are less necessary insurance in their mind they don't feel like they need them as much so they're not going to get them so those are the basic buyers and then finally we have a group of consumers that's willing to spend um, again on the necessities but then on some of these other products that are less needed they're willing to buy those as well and hold on to them um, so these would be premium buyers. They may be your platinum customers um, and they're willing to um, really become overinsured possibly even. Um, and so now we have sort of a description of each of the three segments and now we have some data to back up how they, each one behaves and we can begin to decide which market segments we want to aggressively pursue and what type of marketing plan we want to lay out for each one of these three market segments. So we have the minimizers and all three here. It appears as though they share very similar market size all in the 30% range. Um, we have revenue. Of course, we're going to get a lot more revenue from the premium buyers and the least from the minimizers. Going to have a lot more problems. So these guys are going to cost us a lot more than minimizers and the buyers will cost us less. Um, but here's the thing. We need the minimizers because they make up a lot of volume in, relative to our business. So even though they're not the most profitable, um, by volume, we need their cash flow coming in to be able to support what we're doing. So again, we have three different market segments um, and some are better than others from a profitability standpoint um, or a, re a margin standpoint anyways. And each of these different market segments requires different needs from us. Um, they need to be treated differently. And so now we have these groups segmented, um, we can begin to address that situation. All right, so now the final thing we'll do is just mention a quick word. And um, we you know, don't spend enough time talking about business to business environments, but we know that most business um, from a dollar perspective is performed in a B2B market. Um, however, um, we just don't spend a lot of time doing it. The process is more or less the same though, where we look for markets, segments that are stable over time, that would be profitable for us, that we can reach, 
um, that, that we can identify with and so forth. Um, however, the segmentation criteria probably just changes a little bit. So we do have firm demographics. So that would include like the size of the firm, sales volume, how many locations they have and so forth. We also have psychographic characteristics which deal with the culture of the firm and sort of the, the pulse and the DNA of the firm and how they behave and act and so forth. Um, how, they, um, how they react if they're very uh, risk averse or risk loving, um, whether they're heavy on tech and innovative and so forth. And then of course we also have their usage behaviors how they use our product, if they're using our product or service. Um, there may also be um, issues that deal with um, their, their procurement process um, and so forth, like if they have a formal uh, purchasing uh, process or if not, and uh, whether they are large enough to have uh, representatives and um, a request for purchase and, and so on and so forth. So, so there are certainly criteria and segmentation bases that we can use to identify our business customers, just as we would our individual um, B2C types of customers too. And the processes are generally the same uh, where we look for different market segments um, and we identify those. And then in the next step, we'll target ones that are profitable and position our products towards them. So this is gonna wrap up then this discussion on market segmentation. We walked through the general uh, process um, and things we wanna look for for market segments. We also spent um, a good amount of time talking about customer profiles.